Selling your dental practice is the second biggest decision you will make in your career. And buying that dental practice is the biggest. This is Paul, Dr. Nacho. I'm thrilled to be on here with our key resource and sponsor from DDS Match. You're going to meet here in just a minute. We are dedicated to helping you buy and sell practices with more success and less stress. If you are interested in buying a practice, text buy to 215 215- Five four three six four five four. If you're interested in selling your practice, text sell to 215-543-6454. Now I'd like you guys to meet my expert from DDS Match, key resource and sponsor of the group. Please share with us who you are and what you do in your daily day to help Dennis. Yeah. Hey, Paul, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it very much. And I'm proud to be a sponsor of Dental Nachos hey. also. My name's Andy Edmister. work out of Texas and New Mexico. I have a business partner, Randy Kennison, that we're DDS Match Southwest together. It was been in the dental industry for, gosh, probably close to 30 years now. Got my start with Densply. I was a Densply Cock rep- representative, the old LD Cock. Yeah. And did that. Then I spent 10 years with the district, one of the largest distributors, before I jumped off and joined DDS Match. Love that. And I, I love that you've taken some clinical and practice management CE. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I've I've kind of been a junkie on practice management and actually, you know, when it's kind of helped me grow my market, you know, when a doctor would, you know, talk to me about price or whatever, and yeah, I'd say, hey, if I could help you cover the cost of your supplies or, yeah. or piece of equipment, if I can show you how to do it without adding any more patients or any more hours or any more without using any more gloves or anything, would you be open to working with me. And, you know, then that's kind of how I got my started and built a really large territory. Love that. That's awesome. And one of the things I'll share is someone who owns two dental practices. And then I also have Dennis Job Connect and Dental Nachos. As a dental practice owner, it is just totally overwhelming the number of vendors that you have to manage to get through your day. I mean, if you look at my dental nachos company, Annie, it says all the people we pay. And then you look at my dental practice, that would be like one of those movies where the list keeps going and going. And I just think not many dentists realize that until they get into the profession. And it's just one of the complexities of running a dental business. And I think it's awesome that you help dentists make it less complex. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it was simple. Hey, if I can help you reach your goals, will you help me reach mine? Yeah, I love that. Well, we're going to talk about what you do in your daily day to help dentists buy and sell practices. You shared a little bit about your background so far. And, you know, how does that qualify you to be a professional dental practice broker? Tell our audience about that. You know, I mean, I've been in the industry a long time. Most, you know, most of my good friends and people I work with happen to be dentists, you know, just yeah. over the years and, and, you know, just that experience. And like we mentioned, you know, I've taken a lot of clinical practice cl- courses. I've, I've been through some of the, you know, some week long boot camps and with clients of mine went through the, as the only, you know, representative, not oh. a dentist in through that. And I've, gone through Pinnacle's leadership program and also Sandy Purdue's classic practice resources program. That's great. I mean, because you really then you really know the game dentists are playing. I always share, spoke to some residents yesterday. People love to know that someone is an insider and knows the inside of what they're doing, whatever that field may be. And you know, our, our grandmothers were right. Uh, Andy, Dennis, we're very special. We need our own accountants. We need our own attorneys. We need our own banks. I always say this, you know, we're going to talk about buying and selling practices, but you know, Many people, I don't know if you, Dennis has told you this, they come into our offices and they say, I just want to let you know, I hate the dentist. And I want to say, I just want to let you know, you could have kept that inside of your head. Okay. Now, but you know, who loves us is banks, right? We have, you know, someone leaves dental school. Maybe you can help our audience with this. Even if it's something that is, you know, seems very simple to someone like you, if a dentist has $500,000 in debt, will a bank still consider them to be a good risk? Will they still give them money? to buy a $750,000 practice? Well, it depends on what type of debt. You know, if it's student loans, probably, yes. Yeah. But if it's credit card debts and- Good point. They're irresponsible, then, you know, probably not, or absolutely not, you know, so- no, I love how you kind of made a distinction there, which is really good. I actually wasn't thinking that when you when I asked the question. I was only thinking of the student loans. But if I have a, if you meet a 50-year-old dentist who said, no one can ever buy my practice because these young dentists have too much debt. They have too right. many student loans. They'll never get the loan. We're here to share with them in a positive way that that's actually not true. And, you know, are you working with banks and your deals that are find the field of dentistry favorable, positive, and want to lend them money? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we've got some great strategic partnerships with some different, you know, dental specific banks and, and, you know, and so they look at it a little bit differently, you know, and, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of friends, you know, just from the local community and stuff and college friends and stuff that are local bankers at, at local banks. And, and, it, and we, we've tried really hard to network and help, you know, help some of our buddies and, you know, introduce them to some dentists. And, you know, when they look at what the dental specific lenders are doing, you know, and, and it, and it changes, but, you know, like this a couple of years ago, went in and went in, had lunch with banker and, and at a boardroom table at the bank actually. And, um, they wanted to learn about this dental business and wanted to get into it as local bank and showed them what they were offering, like zero, zero down, no collateral, you know, some of them have graduated payments, you know, to help them get help, help get started or zero interest for the first year. But at that time, the rates were, you know, like sub 2%. And they're just scratching their head, like, how can they do this? Yeah. Down. And, and I was actually at a bank presentation, and you probably know this also, but a bank presentation one day, a dental bank presentation, and they showed, you know, that dentists were the second least likely profession to default on a loan. So basically, there's not there's not much of a risk yeah. to a dentist. And, th and that should inspire anyone listening, because we're going to talk about DSOs and private practice dentists, but it should inspire anyone listening that there are just amazing opportunities, whether you have debt from dental school, whether you're frustrated with your associate position to get into practice ownership in a way. And that, you know, that's, I mean, maybe, you know, what you do in your daily day is make dreams come true. And yep. maybe tell us what's the difference in the dream. You're making the seller dream come true because they don't want to practice anymore, right. but we'll stick with private practice for a minute. And yep. then you're making the buyer's dream come true for a private practice seller. That's collecting less than $1.2 million a year. How long are they often staying on after the transition? What's their time frame that they're usually staying on for? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's really different and I'll try to answer generally, you know, generally, but you know, most of the time, you know, if you're doing sub $1.2 million, you know, they want to bring somebody in. Well, you can't really do that unless you're willing to cut back some of your production. So, you know, but most of our, most of the dentists, you know, they just kind of finish up treatment in progress and, you know, help with the transition of the business and, you know, exit that way. Now, a $1.2 million practice, so the seller, if they wanted to stay and the buyer wanted them to stay, then, you know, they'd have to do it on a reduced schedule and, you know, put an associate agreement in place and, you know, it's, it works out really well. Yeah. Most and it, 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 so that's why I think, you know, the difference between a private practice and a DSO sale, just to educate our audience for a second, Andy, let's say you have a $1.7 million practice, you want to transition to a DSO. How often are they often asking you to stay on after the sale? Well, with the DSO, I mean, almost all the time. Almost all yeah. the time, you know, we have, you know, regardless, you know, we have, you know, worked with a couple that are actually pretty flexible about clinical hours, but they still have to, you know, be the owner, be a partial owner and retain, you know, for three to five years, even, not, even if they're not doing clinical. But I'd say in, in my experience, you know, probably 95% of the DSOs, you know, expect them to stay and produce at the same level that they have been historically, you know, for Prior the last, last few years. Now, tell me about the mindset of a seller and preparing for their practice sale and transition. Since you know the inside of a dental office, Andy, one of the most frustrating patients to me is when they come and say, hey, Dr. Paul, I need my front te teeth fixed for my daughter's wedding. I need my front teeth fixed for my daughter's wedding. I want to look good. I say, great, Mrs. Smith. When's your daughter's wedding? She goes, two weeks from now. And I go, I think you planned this wedding, you know, more than two weeks ago. Why right. didn't you come to me sooner? And maybe we can use this, you know, funny kind of example in terms of preparing for a sale. When should this audience, if you're thinking, oh, I might want to sell my practice, be connecting with somebody like you to learn about what they need to do? Well, you know, I kind of giggle because my daughter's actually getting married. My oh, old... congratulations. Yeah, pretty soon here in a few months. So I was thinking about her. She needs to get to her dentist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. But, oh, to answer your question, and I'm sorry, Paul, can we do no, that? No, I mean, it's like, we, I use the example of, and you know, you know, you're a good dad to think you got to put a note to tell her to go get her, you know, make sure she does her hygiene visit. But yeah. many, when 
patients make us feel pressure that has to something has to be done soon. It's right. uncomfortable. And I find that dentists selling their practice will often not start preparing until it's too late. Kind of walk us through the ideal time frame to connect with someone like you to talk about, understand, have a conversation about their practice sale. Yeah. So in an ideal world, they'd come to us five years out, you know, in an ideal situation. And, you know, and, you know, we'd help them help them with our, you know, group circle of trusted advisors and help them get geared up. You know, we actually, you know, have that practice optimizer experience, which is yeah. a great tool. And, you know, but most of our, most of the doctors call us on a Thursday at, you know, 5.15 and like, I don't, I want to be out of here. I'm ready to go, you know, or Monday, Monday morning early before they go into the office, they're like, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to go. And, and, you know, at that point, there's not a whole lot we can do, just a whole lot we can do. But, you know, when, you know, when we go in through practice management reports on a doctor like that said, Hey, I'm ready to get out of here now. And on our first conversation, you know, I'm looking through practice reports and, you know, and I'm looking at things like on their billing and coding, you know, one, they've never, you know, if they're in network, they've never negotiated their fees. Yeah. I want you to pause there for a second. Cause I didn't know this existed. So, so this may help someone right now. Okay. Make money, save time, be happier. Tell us about this. You just said about negotiating your insurance fees. You own a practice right now. You're listening to Andy DDS match broker and professional. Tell us about this why they should look to negotiate their insurance fees. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they're in all the insurance, they're all contracts. So if, you know, if you're listening and you've been in it for a year, well, you might not be able to, they might expire and, you know, be two years or three years or one year contract. So that'd be the first thing I'd look at. But, you know, if you're a new dentist with new dentist right from the get go, it's, you know, and it's kind of on our buyer's checklist. Hey, here's some great credentialing companies, you know, talk to them, but you know, when I'm looking at looking through these reports, I'm just seeing seeing the fees that had been negotiated, and these companies will go in and they'll do a zip code analysis and tell you like how many actual members are in each right insurance or you know per employer and all that. And so, one, you can make a good decision instead of being like, "Hey, what Humana Delta this?" Because my friends are on them. You know, they'll tell you which ones has the most patients and then they'll negotiate the fees for you and come back and, you know, they do it on their point. And, you know, it might have changed. I'm not a practice consultant, yeah. but, you know, they typically do it off of your top 20 feet. Top and 20 guess what, Andy, us dentists, you make more money for doing nothing, right? You just can make more money for doing nothing. That is my second favorite thing in life. First would be if they took calories out of my favorite food. Okay. But nachos. number two, yes, calories out of nachos. So I, I encourage everyone. That's a, it's a golden nacho tip you've shared there. What I want to talk about next is the advice. If you're thinking about selling to a DSO, this is a very emotional topic for dentists. I have people coming up to me at meetings, Andy, and they say, Hey, Dr. Nacho, I will never sell to a DSO. And I say, cool. What's the DSO? And they go, no idea. Okay. So yeah. Give yeah. our audience some tips, advice, things to think about when they're considering selling to a DSO. Yeah. And, and, you know, you know, like kind of with DDS match, you know, I mean, our first question is, you know, are you ready? You know, are you ready to move on with the transition? You know, if you're not, then, you know, people are kind of, you know, testing the waters or whatever, but they got to be ready, you know, and, and being ready, you know, are you ready to exit now? Or are you ready to exit in two, three, four, five years from now? So that'd be the first question I'd ask him. But as far as being prepared, you know, just, you know, DSOs, a, kind of a lo loose term, you know, some, some DSOs, you know, are a group of three or four dentists that have grown yeah a few practices and then you go all the way up to you know heartland dental which thousands of practices across the united states so there's a lot in between and you know if they if they're wanting to stay their practice isn't large enough to you know bring on and an, a partner to exit out over the next you know year or two and the dso is the best option for them then you know, we just kind of find out what's most important to them and, you know, try to match, you know, clinical philosophies and, you know, some of them do more, you know, more administrative stuff than others. Some give you autonomy, a little more autonomy, 
And, you know, some also, you know, we partnered up some younger doctors with some for growth partners, you know, where Tell me, now that's interesting. You you've been around this profession for years. You know, what do you think the motivating factor is for dentists to sell to a DSO versus a private practice? I'll frame it this way, Andy. Your practice first has to be large enough collection wise for a DSO to consider you. So right. if you're listening and you have an $800,000 practice, there is a 90 a very 99% chance you're going to be selling to a private practice buyer. Yeah. I, would you agree? Yes. Yes. So now we have gotten to, let's just use this $1.7 million practice, one that's large enough for a dentist to sell to a DSO. What are you finding? Because you're talking, are there motivating factors to say, hey, I want to go this DSO route instead of the private practice route? Right. Well, I mean, one of the motivation is, you know, they hear their, you know, an EBITDA. I know you're big on EBITDA. You know, I am. It's my going to name my boat but I don't have a boat. But if I get one one day, I'm naming yep. it that. EBITDA yep. for life. And I want one of your t-shirts, by the way, <laughs> EBITDA. I'll get you one, yeah. Biceps <laughs> and EBITDA. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's the, so, you know, people say, hey, we got, you know, six times, eight times, whatever. But, you know, when we're negotiating with these private equity and DSO, you know, like we'll have a EBITDA number from our evaluators, then they'll come in, the EBITDAs, their EBITDA number's lower, and then we kind of go back and forth and negotiate. Yeah. With the EBITDA, you know, if you don't have any representation helping you with that, then sure, you might have got 12 times your EBITDA, but the DSO picked that number for you. you right. Know? Yeah. So I just the think- key point is the, the one of the key points is there is an opportunity to make more total dollars, not a guarantee, right. but an opportunity to make more total dollars with the DSO. But one of my thoughts, and you know, it may not always be about the money partnering with the DSO. No, what are some right. of the other motivating factors you've heard, Dennis? Yeah, so. well, you know, and, you know, it's funny, you know, like probably when you got out of dental school or back when I was at Dentspa, you know, people came out and, you know, hung up a shingle or, you know, joined their family dentist back in their hometown. And that was more normal now. A lot of the younger dentists are coming out and want to be the next Heartland, you know. So an example in Austin, we, you know, sold the practice. Doctor been out seven, eight years and just was on her third startup that hadn't quite opened yet owned wow. two and the third and just and realized it's a lot harsher than than yeah. it, it's hard to be a dentist you know hard to manage you know you got you know you're looking in the mouth you know 32 hours a week but you've got a million dollar or two million or three billion dollar go business going on around you it's it's hard to manage with employees and you know, I'm ever and that's the part, you know, I think that is just important to highlight that it's very exhausting to manage the outside the operatory parts of dentistry, as you noted. Right. And to dentists, they see DSOs and DPOs as helping them with that. We all know if you've been in this world long enough that sometimes that comes true. And we also know that sometimes that doesn't come true. But if everyone's learning from Andy and I today, it's that that is something that is the exhaustion level. You know, I was on my group last night, Andy, and I was talking about a deal, you know, someone could get a high enterprise value, total dollars, right? 2.4 million for 7.4 million, right? And I know that's pretty gaudy. And there's some, there's more than meets the eye to that for people to look at EBIT and how long they want them to stay. But someone said, why would a dentist like that ever want to sell their golden goose, right? And right. I said, because it's really tiring to run that goose. Yeah, and yeah until you've done it for a long time. And that's why I love what you guys do. You give people creative options, partnering with private practices. I mean, my brother and I have, you know, we didn't talk about this. You could sell to a multi-group owner that's all private. And, you know, that might be a middle road for people. We bought right. someone's practice and they stayed on for three years as a private practice associate as right. we filled some in. So, you know, as we wrap up, Andy, there's something you mentioned that I want you to highlight, the practice optimizer experience. So okay. if someone's listening saying, hey, I'm in the Texas area, New Mexico area. I want to talk to Andy and his team. What does that practice optimizer experience do for them? Well, it, it just, you know, pretty much takes their whole financial picture and put it in a really nice, easy to understand binder, you know, and, and, and I say binder, but or digital, it's, yeah. we take everything, you know, like we talk about negotiating fees, you know, Hey, you know what we can increase, you know, had the office just do it in San Antonio, just renegotiated their fees like eight months ago. 
we're getting them ready and and they're 18% and That's you know awesome. they're not seeing any more patients or using any more cops and didn't hire another employee and their rent didn't go up a penny. So all that goes to the bottom line. And so, I mean, that's significant growth. So that's, that's one part of it. And, you know, there's several parts, but another is, you know, getting with a, a good probate and will attorney, make sure their family's taken care of, get them with a top notch. If they don't are, if they're not already working with one, we get them with a top notch financial advisor that, you know, does a forecast of their retirement. Um, they're, you know, we get them with Blue and Company, our yeah. partners for our business valuations. And we, you know, we stage a business valuation. Hey, this is what it looks like today. It's not complete. We're not planning on showing it to buyers or anything. It's just, hey, this is where we are right now. And if the doctor owns owns his or her real estate, then they take that into account. And then once they put all of these items together, it says, hey, all right, well, they know what their goal is to get to that retirement number, but more times than not, they're like, Hey, I can retire now. Yeah. So a, a lot of times we're not getting, you know, they're calling us and thinking five years out and they might not, you know, even make it a year by the time we do this whole analysis. And, you know, another great tool for this is that, like I mentioned the binder, they get a binder, they put that in their safe or filing cabinet and God forbid, if something happens to them, you know, their spouse, loved ones can take, pick that up. Hey, called DDS match. Here's the card. And we've already got everything. Kind yeah, of you're ready to go. I mean, that's one of the things I think what you share is so key, you know, prepare everyone in your life for your eventual transition. Do right. it earlier than you think. I'm assuming when you do the practice optimizer, you probably learn something you can make better about your practice anyway. Right. Absolutely. You know, if you went to a, a full body fitness assessment. I bet, you know, they would tell me I got to be more flexible so you can also make your practice better now. So I thank you so much, Andy, for sharing all of your awesome tips and advice with us from starting early, from learning about DSOs, from reminding your children to go to the dentist. I like that part too. Um, uh, but if people would like to connect with you and the DDS Match team, they can text buy to 215-543-6454. They can text sell to 215-543-6454. And just remind our audience one more time as we wrap up, Benny, what regions, what areas do you cover if they want to connect with you? Yes, uh uh, DDS Match Southwest, we cover West Texas, Central Texas, and South Texas, and the entire state of New Mexico. Awesome, Andy. Well, really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks so much for supporting us as a sponsor. We truly appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much.